not too long ago, in a place not too far from my heart, I discovered this memory that helps me remember the power of solidarity in the moments of life. One of my favorite professors said something that I will always remember. He turned to me one day and he said, I like you, you have an intuitive grasp of the obvious. <laughs> and I was like, okay, is that a compliment or an insult? <laughs> you see, in a world gone wild, inventing insignificance, Insignificance was my first name, insignificance was my middle name, and insignificance was my last name. It was the trifecta of insignificance. I was the first person in my family to go to college. English was my second language, and I come from a family of immigrants and exiles. So the intersectionality of my reality felt very obvious and hidden at the same time. And I wasn't quite sure what he was noticing or not noticing about my presentation of self. So given these dynamics, you might imagine where my thoughts went, right? And please pardon my Spanish and not my French, because I'm going to share with you in my best Spanglish thought bubble, what went through my mind. Ready? Listos? So I said to myself, is this payaso for real? Is he suffering from pedojitis? And this is a disease that I made up a long time ago. And I would never really say that out loud, especially not to my favorite professor, even back then when I knew nothing about mindfulness. I knew enough to take a second look at my first thought. So I paused and I turned to him and I said, Dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. And I asked him, Do you know what that means? And he said, No. So I translated, <laughs> right? And I said, it means tell me who you hang with and I will tell you who you are. <coughs> Because right now you're hanging with me, so what's true for you just might be true for me. I'm just saying. <laughs> and after I said that, he took a step back and it was grillitos, crickets, <laughs> silence. What he said next changed the trajectory of my life. What he said next launched the start of my work. He looked into my eyes and whispered with a tenderness that touched my heart. He said, what is not so clear to the many is oh so clear to the few like you. And I got to tell you, in that moment, I felt that Master Yoda had entered the building, <laughs> right? I was like, okay. And I wasn't quite sure, was he exaggerating? Was he being nice? Or was it simply a Jedi mind trick? <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> you see, Dr. Ellis Hayes, my mentor, who would become a lifelong friend and business partner, said something that I needed to hear at a time when I needed to hear it. And his words brought me out of the darkness of insignificance and into the light as a person who mattered in that moment. And our bond created a path to graduate school, to earning a PhD, Our bond created a path back to the same class that Dr. Ellis Hayes had taught and developed for over 20 years. Before he passed away, we had a conversation and he asked me to take care of his class and to honor the work that we had done not so long ago. And a week, a week after his passing, 
his daughter gave me a call to let me know that I was the last person Ellis spoke to before he passed away. And I had no idea. I had no idea that his last words were his last wish. But I know this. I know this for sure. It is one of the great privileges of my life to be teaching that class today. And as I think back to that time with my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Ellis Hayes, I'm reminded of the many moments of solidarity and significance that we bring into the lives of other people, as he did in mine. And I realize that that thinking, that insight, is at the very core of my work, at the intersections of identity, intentionality, and agency. And identity can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, don't get me wrong, but for me, identity is the idea that you are a certain uh, character in every scene of life. And you might ask yourself, what character am I in this scene? Who am I playing? And intentionality is basically the notion that you have a motivation, that you have a purpose. And you might ask yourself, what is my purpose? What's my motivation? And finally, there's agency, which is the capacity to take action the capacity to move in the world in ways that work. And here you might ask yourself, what can I do? How can I move in the world in ways that work? Because you see, more and more we're discovering that the truth of you is not something that you own, but a significance that arises out of social relationships. The truth of you in the world is not a static thing, but something that's defined by the roles that you play and the dialogue that comes from those roles. And finally, the truth of you in the world is not disembodied, but deeply, deeply rooted in the history and the culture of your being as you move in the world. And these, these insights are at the very heart of my thinking as I work with students, over 10,000 of them, in the last decade alone. And these ideas are at the very heart of my thinking as I write my book. And for me, these ideas are at the very heart of the democracy of spirit that we bring to light through our interactions with each other. And as I reflected on these insights, especially as I came here and prepared to speak with you, I thought that I would ask myself those three questions. Who am I in this scene, on this stage? What is my purpose here? And what can I do as I speak with you? And I got an answer, a kind of a feeling came up, it turned into words, and in a moment of inspiration, I heard a voice speak to me, very authentically, in a moment of vulnerability. I listened, and it sounded something like this. If democracy dies in darkness, then liberty lives in light. And today, I choose to live in the light of that liberty so that we, we do not wallow in the weight of our wake, because a wake is a place to honor the dead and the past with important but only limited links to the future, which is a mystery that we unwrap in the unfolding present. The future is our daily destiny, a destiny that we must embrace if we are to give voice to that shining truth that resides in our souls and give that beaming beacon of hope its proper place in the world of things that matter in the light of this moment. And I'm reminded that light is a metaphor that poets and mystics have used throughout the ages. And I'd like to share one of those poems today. Rumi, the 13th century Sufi mystic, put it so. En tu luz aprendo a amar, en tu belleza como crear poemas, tu bailas adentro de mi pecho, donde nadie te ve, pero a veces yo sí te veo 
y esa vista se convierte en este arte. And in English, in your light, I learn how to love. In your beauty, how to make poems. You dance inside my chest where no one sees you. But sometimes, sometimes I do, and that sight becomes this art. And as I reflect on these words, I'm reminded of the many moments in life when we are called to discover our humanity, our sense of identity. In the moments of communing and connecting with each other, we are called to discover our sense of purpose for moving in the world as we do, our sense of agency. Because you and I know that it takes but an instant to infuse hope into the hallowed tapestry of a human heart. It takes but a second to summon a sacred soul into the sanctity of love's succulent splendor. It takes but a moment to change the trajectory of a life. Because it is in the moments of life that we move mountains in communion with each other, that we light up another life. And I'm reminded of such a moment in my life, and I'd like to share that story before I leave you today. I met Daniel and his family at a local park, and uh, Daniel was about four or five at the time, and he was fixated on this red balloon that he just couldn't have. And I saw him and his dad going back and forth, and Daniel was saying, I want the red balloon. And his dad was saying, you can't have it. You know, and they were going back and forth, and I thought, gosh, these people need some help. And so, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> it was quite a moment. But it gets better. Um, so I paused, and I asked myself three questions. Who am I in this scene? What is my purpose? And what can I do to help? And an answer came, and I got my answer, and I turned to Daniel, and I said, Daniel, what's your favorite color? And he looked up at me, and he said, red! You know, fixated on that red balloon that he just couldn't have. And I said, come on, Daniel, a lot of people like red. Isn't there some special color just for you that you can like right now? And he looked up at me and he goes, oh, green, 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 right? Like little kids do it, it was quite adorable. And at that point, his dad, bless his heart, came in on perfect cue and said, that's right, Daniel, green is your special color. And for some reason, I felt compelled in that moment to reach into my side pocket, pull out my wallet. And I wasn't quite sure what I would find there. <laughs> and I found a green parking stub, a green ticket. And I showed it to Daniel, making sure that he saw it. And after I did that, it was grillitos, crickets, Silence. What was said next created a new future in the unfolding present. It created a new trajectory in that moment. I got down on one knee, I looked Daniel in the eye, and I said to him, what is not so clear to the many is oh so clear to the few like you. And I took the ticket and I put it in his hands. And I took a step back and I said, Daniel, you know all too well that red means stop and green, green means go. And his dad once again came in on perfect cue and said, Daniel, now you can use the green ticket to get a green balloon. And I said, that's right, Daniel. You can use the green ticket to get a green balloon later, right? And Daniel, at that point, was done. He took a step back. He was holding on to his ticket, looked up at me, looked up at his dad, and in a slight hypnotic trance was saying, I can go get the green balloon later. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I felt that Daniel's dad and I, I felt that we were channeling Obi-Wan at that point. 
right? Jedi mind trick, red is not the color of the balloon that you are looking for. <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing. And I realized that Daniel allowed the words green and red to take on new meaning that day as he allowed those words to sit in the sanctuary of his heart for the first time and bring them to new light in that moment. And I realized that it was so beautiful to be working in solidarity with people that I did not know very well. But in a moment, we were able to bring light to a situation and show Daniel that he was not alone, that he had value, that he had purpose, that we could put him first in that moment. And I know that you may be caring for a Daniel in your life. And your Daniel might be a Daniel, the masculine form in Spanish. Or she might be Daniela, the feminine form in Spanish. Or they might simply be D, non-binary in English. Someone caring this way comes in the midst of opportunity. And that opportunity can take many forms. But the intoxicating fragrance of your caring by any other name does smell as sweet. So take a moment, today or tomorrow, take an instant in one way or another to infuse, to summon, to change in the most sacred manner possible so that at least one heart, one soul, one life knows without a doubt that they are not alone, that they have value, that they are here with you for a reason beyond all understanding. This is your moment. This is your instant. This is your second to make another person first. Take that second and become a first for someone. And not just for them, but for you, for your family, and for the future of our democracy. In this way, democracy dies not in darkness, but lives in the liberty you bring to light. Because someone caring this way comes, and that someone is you. Thank you.